Hi, I'm Sumana Hariharishwara. I'm the founder of Change Set Consulting, a small consultancy that focuses on project management for free and open source software projects and the companies that depend on them. So just so you know, I will not be sharing any slides today, so please feel free to look away from the screen, do some sit-ups, look out the window, fold some laundry or something. And if you prefer to read rather than listen, the written version of this is now up on my blog at hadihadeshwana.net, including links to resources. In your open source project, maybe you're seeing different contributors contributing at different rates and in different rhythms, and that's causing strain. Your symptoms might include long waits for feedback and reviews, problems discussing issues and coming to decisions fast enough for everyone to feel reasonably satisfied, uh, resentment both by those who are waiting and those who feel rushed and overloaded, uh, and ultimately problems with morale, retention, and really everything else. Sometimes Sometimes different participant groups want different project velocities and rhythms. That's cadence shear. Like when most of your team is volunteer, but there is one Google Summer of Code intern who's working 35 to 40 hours a week for three months and who needs faster turnaround on code reviews. Or when some of your contributors are tied to the release cycle for a related organization or project like a programming language, but some are not. Or maybe a few different companies, nonprofits, government agencies, or academic teams are maintaining and improving a tool together, but one of them is working way slower or way faster than everyone else. In general, cadence shear is a problem where different subsets of the team are attuned to different deadlines or have different levels of urgency for project progress. So first off, this is a problem of success. Congratulations, your open source project includes contributors with genuinely different incentives and from genuinely different contexts, but it's still a problem. So let's talk about some of the participant configurations that you see in this situation. Paid plus volunteers, volunteers plus time limited paid, paid teams in a consortium, volunteers with disparate deadline affiliations. Let's talk about some approaches to learning and addressing everyone's expectations. There's a saying that every criticism is the tragic result of an unmet need. And in keeping with that, a lot of these recommendations boil down to setting expectations and aligning on priorities. And I'll share some specifics on how to do that. In this talk, I am going to mainly assume that you are the leader of the project in question, but sometimes I will share tips and suggestions for what a contributor can do in this situation. And I hope it's useful for you to consider the situation from both perspectives of what we owe to each other and what we can offer. Let's start with a scenario of multiple different paid teams from different organizations that are trying to work on a project together, but not all at the same speed. Here is an example that one of my friends told me about. He works at an organization that houses a project where they're trying to get wide adoption plus encourage a multi-vendor ecosystem around it to support that wide adoption. And they are pretty resource constrained. And a vendor said, let's team up. We will write code for the features that we want. The vendor had a strong, dedicated engineering team and could produce code pretty quickly but they ran into a big problem because of the code review bottleneck. The vendor would put several developers onto a task and they'd take a month to write it and submit it for review. And then the development team at the host organization would have to shift away from their own priorities, take a week to go through and review this code and ask for revisions and fall behind on their own roadmap. And the vendor's customers were getting antsy about getting these new features delivered. The host organization said, look, we want to make this work, but we need more help test with testing resources to get through these reviews faster. And the vendor said, okay, we can help with that. But unfortunately, the testing service that they hired was not one that would just slot in manually and adapt to the existing infrastructure and code base. They could only work with a code base that hooked into the testing services, pre-existing automated test infrastructure. So then the host organization tried to spend a bunch of time making those changes, which made the review capacity issues worse. But, but fundamentally there was a disconnect 
between these two partner organizations because they did not genuinely share a roadmap and a vision for what to prioritize together. And so before the testing integration could bear fruit, the conflict was resolved with a fork. And now there's duplicated effort and a bunch of bad things that happen when there's a fork. So what could they have done instead? Well, the biggest one is modularize, structure the architecture so that people who want to add their own features can do so by creating an add-on, an extension, or integrating with the core that you maintain, but they do so through a repository that they control and through interfaces they can depend on. Uh, so, for example, uh, companies that want to add functionality to MongoDB can start with a language-specific driver. And they're encouraged to do so explicitly because among other reasons, among other reasons, there's fewer requirements to get a pull request approved, right? There's fewer moving parts in a driver than in the core server. Uh, and it's Apache licensed. Among other things, you do not have to sign the contributor agreement when contributing to these drivers that could hold up the pull request process. Another important approach give them ways to contribute that will actually aid in your code review capacity. Uh, for instance, ask them to review your code too, in a non-binding way. A first pass code review from an engineer who can at least do a basic round of testing, find bugs, ask about things that don't make sense and so on, will help save time for more senior developers who can then focus on the more high octane concerns like security, performance, and maintainability. And reviewing your company's code will also help them learn how you do things, which will make their pull requests easier to review and merge in the future. I actually spoke about this at Upstream last year in sidestepping the PR bottleneck for non-dev ways to support your Upstreams, which includes some more ways that you could encourage your partners to contribute without getting stuck in a review backlog. There's money, of course, uh, but also mentorship for new contributors, coaching and work assistance for your existing contributors, and providing and maintaining testing infrastructure. But also, on a more abstract level, ask yourself about your strategy. Do you actually want wide adoption, external participation, and a multi-organization ecosystem? Is that something you're strategically committed to? Because if so, you will probably need to genuinely share roadmap and process with them. If you don't actually want that, then pull off the band-aid and acknowledge that you simply aren't going to take substantive contributions from anyone outside your own team. So you can set expectations early and avoid frustration. Here, I would encourage folks to read the to-do groups guidance effective open source development and participation, which can help you make the argument internally that no, it's worth investing in collaboration upfront so that you can avoid the unfortunate outcome in the anecdote I, I told you. Uh, I also suggest that you take a look at the to-do group's guidance on understanding upstream open source projects, especially the section on schedule and timing considerations. And pass that along to the contributing organization because it suggests, and I'm gonna quote here, if you have internal developers who are making upstream contributions, you will need to budget time in their schedules to allow for these contributions to be made. It's important to create and maintain a separation of upstream work and product work. In other words, it's recommended to provide your open source developers with guaranteed time to meet their upstream aspirations and responsibilities. In the absence of such an upstream time guarantee, it's easy for these team members to be sucked into becoming an extension of product teams, resulting in their upstream focus drying up in favor of product development, which may help in the short term, but can ultimately lead to loss of your organization's reputation in the upstream community, which can ne negatively affect your ability to help guide the upstream project in areas beneficial to your organization." End quote. If you're dealing with Cadence Shear from the contributor side of the table, I hope this guidance can help you make the argument internally that it's worth it to adjust your cadence to work better with your upstream. Next, let's talk about the situation where the core contributors are paid by the same organization and are aligned on the same cadence and roadmap, but 
external contributors, especially volunteers, are not. This is a really common situation. For example, when I started working at the Wikimedia Foundation, most of the maintainers of MediaWiki were not paid by Wikimedia Foundation or were not paid at all for their MediaWiki work. And the engineering department expanded to the point where we were employing more than half of the maintainers over time. And so we developed a more and more coherent roadmap of priorities for what the paid folks would work on in contrast to the much more fluid situation from when it was almost entirely people from lots of different organizations or none at all. But we wanted to ensure that people outside the foundation, in particular volunteers, could make meaningful contributions. And this was partly for basically ideological reasons, ensuring we didn't just turn into an elite ivory tower, but also for pragmatic reasons. Making sure that MediaWiki stays a multi-vendor, multipolar project is good for the continued health of the project. For example, it helps MediaWiki stay attuned to changes in technology and user needs, and it helps grow contributors whom the foundation or other vendors might later hire. Uh, if you're interested in why you shouldn't just hire all the really promising volunteers, I recommend Bern Reese's piece on why WordPress dominated movable type in the competition among CMSs several years ago, among other things, the company Six Apart hired all the movable type experts, uh, basically, and made them unavailable as leaders and vendors instead of encouraging them to grow into a strong ecosystem. But of course, those volunteer type participants, and here I include engineers whose companies are letting them take a day or a week or a month as a kind of community service sabbatical to contribute to a project. These participants are episodic and don't show up already knowing about and plugged into your roadmap and schedule. And so here I want to refer to a research paper on episodic participation. This is Managing Episodic Volunteers in Free Libra Open Source Software Communities by Anne Barkham, Klaus Jan Stoll, Brian Fitzgerald, and Dirk Reel, published in 2020. I was at the Wikimedia Foundation from 2011 to 2014, and I really wish I'd had this paper back then. You all are lucky. Uh, as they describe it, Episodic contributors may have less investment in ensuring that their work is completed in a timely manner or is completed at all. This can be especially problematic if the work is important and others are relying on it. They make dozens of recommendations in several categories. I think a lot of those suggestions are ones that reasonably well run open source projects with paid staff are probably doing anyway. So I'm going to focus on highlighting the ones that you might not already be doing and that would particularly help with the cadence shear with episodic participants. In governance, suggestions include manage the delivery triangle, adjust scope, quality, or features, or schedule when project releases cannot be completed on schedule at the desired level of quality with the expected features. If you're really deeply committed to including episodic participant work on the critical path, this is one way you could do it. Another suggestion, define measuring and success. Define what successful engagement of episodic contributors looks like. Describe how you'll measure the impact. This helps you because it makes you make it concrete. What are you looking to achieve by engaging episodic contributors? Because then you're on steadier ground to invest in that and make trade-offs, whatever that ends up looking like for you. In preparation-related suggestions, uh, they include create working groups with a narrow focus. And this is one I've definitely noticed larger open source projects doing as a way to harness interest from people and institutions that are particularly interested in one specific topic while creating a bit of a membrane between that hive of activity and the maybe slower paced work of other sub teams or vice versa. Set expiration dates, set distinct deadlines for initiatives. I have found this approach is surprisingly underused. When you are trying something new in contributor recruitment and onboarding and retention, some kind of experiment, if you don't set an end date, you're likely to just accidentally slide into considering it a new part of the status quo 
without genuinely stopping to evaluate whether it worked. Provide templates for presentations. Create one or more standard slide decks, which your contributors can use with or without modification. Remember, you can use the knowledge and curiosity of episodic participants. Uh, for example, you could ask them to teach about your project at meetups, at conferences, and in their communities. You may have just found your most enthusiastic marketer. Uh, the researchers suggest contributors may be more likely to present if they don't have to create the material themselves. And I can tell you, this has particularly worked well for Google Summer of Code and Outreachy to help enthusiastic supporters spread the word about those programs, for instance, on college campuses. And this is something they can do completely on their own schedule. So it does not cause cadence cheer with yours. And this is related to another recommendation later. Encourage learners to mentor. Engage them in leading other episodic contributors. Let them review episodic contributions. Again, encourage them to do work that doesn't end up waiting for or diverting your critical path. Write modular software, right? Ensure that software is modular. This goes back to what we were saying before. In the onboarding contributors section, I'd like to highlight a few tips. Ask new and infrequent contributors about their expectations, availability, preferences, and experience. I've consulted for a few projects where my team, as a consultancy coming in, was making the first systematic effort they'd ever had to talk with the episodic contributors about what they wanted and their expectations and the context that they were coming from. I think a lot of maintainers would rather do something low touch, like a survey, but that is just not going to give you the same quality of understanding. Because you and the contributor have really different mental models of what contribution even might be structured like. And you have to have a conversation so you can elicit their mental model before you can work with it. And then you can guide people to roles and activities that will fit with their schedule and with yours. Screen potential contributors. Screen them to determine if they're a good match for the role. This may include having availability at the appropriate time or being able to commit to a certain amount of time. Relatedly, explain the need for maintenance. Educate contributors about what happens to a contribution after it's included in the project. Explain the benefits to the project if they remain available to maintain their contribution. I think in open source, we're often inclined to say the sky's the limit. And anyone who wants to try should go for whatever they want to work on. We defer to the contributor's autonomy. But once we take a moment to consider what factors make it really likely that a contributor will be able to succeed, or very unlikely that they'll succeed at a particular role or activity, we can figure out some guidance, some expectations to set. And sharing those up front is actually a good idea. It can save people a lot of unnecessary frustration. And it's motivating, in fact, to contributors who are currently uncertain whether they're qualified, whether they have enough time to try something, whether they'll have enough consistent time to work on a particular task. You've now taken away the guessing, so now they know. The researchers mention guiding to junior jobs. I would add here, for volunteers who are more open to guidance on what they work on, ask them to work on peer-led projects, extensions, add-ons, the larger ecology. Again, modularization here is your friend. Manage task assignments with an application. Use something like a wiki or a bug tracking system to handle the assignment process. The researchers suggest I would connect this with a few of their working with contributors, excuse me, suggestions. Give permission to quit a task. Give people permission to skip a period of work or a task without recrimination and encourage people to quit. Encourage people who no longer wish to fulfill a role or complete tasks to step down. Uh, for example, the Zulip bot tool which has been developed by the Zulip open source community, automatically unassigns a bug if they haven't commented on it or done any work on it in several days. Or for larger responsibilities, uh, later this month on June 21st is the solstice. And at the solstice twice a year is Volunteer Responsibility Amnesty Day. 
The idea is if it's clear who's responsible for a particular activity or task, say through using an assignment system, and we explicitly remind people regularly that it's completely fine to say, actually, no, I need to stop doing this, then if we do that regularly, it means everyone can set more realistic expectations and you can incorporate more realistic plans into your schedule and roadmap. The researchers suggest automate process assistance. Consider automation to help people work through the early processes, such as a, a chat bot or a step-by-step -step interactive site. Again, this helps you decouple your expert's time investment from the contributor's time availability. This is an area where platform support would be welcome, by the way. There's a working with contributors suggestion. Rotate focus areas on schedule. Rotate between different focus areas with a consistent schedule. This is especially good if you have episodic contributors with specialized skills or domain knowledge. People will be able to plan when their expertise is needed. Imagine someone who's full-time at VMware and wants to plan when they can take a sabbatical to contribute to your project. If you can collaborate with them to work on the timing, that's a big help to you both. I'll also add something that these researchers don't go into explicitly, but is kind of implied. If you want to gather contributions from episodic volunteers, you will need to have most of your communication happening asynchronously most of the time. Uh, I recently read a suggested breakdown, 70% of your group's communications ought to be asynchronous using GitHub, Google Docs, Zulip, Slack, and similar tools. 25% synchronous online conversations using live chat tools like Zulip and Slack and video chat tools like Jitsi, Zoom, and Google Meet. And 5% in-person meetups uh, such as uh, annual project and smaller team retreats, hackathons, conferences, and so on. Of course, that depends on COVID, but one big all-day online conference per year would probably make sense to keep everyone aligned. Let's talk now about a situation where your open source project is mostly volunteers, but a set of contributors have some limited time availability and want to work on a particular project. This is similar to the episodic volunteering situation in a mostly paid context, but sort of in reverse. The difference is the time limited people probably have a specific project they're paid to work on. Many of the recommendations we've already discussed on how to manage episodic participants are also good for time limited paid people. If there's any flexibility regarding what you can get the time-limited paid person to work on, be strategic about what they work on. Maybe they should work on infrastructure rather than feature work. For example, one thing my colleague did to help the AutoConf project, which is nearly entirely volunteers, was to write an assessment of the project's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which others have used to better structure and prioritize their work. If the time-limited thing is an internship like Google Summer of Code or Outreachy, then the maintainer team should talk ahead of time and have a clear strategy asking why you've decided to spend time mentoring this person. If the goal is to get a task done, concentrate on that. The deadline becomes similar to crunch time. Everyone has to pitch in and adjust everybody's schedules to get this improvement merged in by the end of the internship. But if you join the program because you have a goal of growing capacity in the long term by growing this contributor for the long run, and building infrastructure, knowing that will help you guide them differently. Maybe you'll mutually decide to adjust what success means for this specific internship, modifying your plan on the task you originally envisioned them doing, having them adjust to your own availability, prioritizing building the relationship over pushing the deliverable. If you're a time-limited Contributor, if you are, and you want to help one of your upstreams, if you're ambitious, one high leverage thing to do is to improve their upstreams. For instance, nearly no one is paid to work on Python tools, Mailman, or Beautiful Soup. If you wanted to make life easier for them, maybe look for where they're waiting on upstream improvements in libraries like Sphinx or LXML or even in the Python standard library. Finally, I want to talk briefly about volunteers with disparate deadline affiliations, like when some but not all of your contributors are tied to the release cycle for a related organization or project like a Debian release or a programming language version. Maybe there's a feature freeze deadline for getting your package into an operating system or compatible with a new programming language version. This one can be harder to think about because it ends up being a fundamental strategy question 
for the project. Maintainers need to get on the same page about how important it is for the project to work under this deadline. Because if it is important, you do need to adhere to it. But if it's a second class priority, then the team ought to find a way to architect things so that these efforts happen in parallel or are modular. A common situation in software for the sciences is that a researcher needs a change to the software in time to write and submit a paper. Now, be explicit and non judgmental about this. Help that researcher understand you don't need your change to the software to necessarily land in Maine on a particular schedule for there to be running code that does what you want. Um, thanks to version control, your paper code doesn't need to get merged into Maine to be referred to in your paper, but it will be a little bit more difficult to refer to your specific code. Now, what, when it's not possible to use modularization or that approach to solve the, hey, my paper code needs to be in a version control repository, it might be a good idea to normalize soft or temporary forks. We do need to acknowledge there's a risk that the merge into main may not happen uh, because once that paper is written, that researcher might have no more time to work on this. So at that point, I would say it depends on the maintainer's judgment of how much they care about helping get that particular change across the finish line. So in conclusion, a lot of these approaches boil down to making hard decisions about what you really value, being upfront about your expectations and your needs, and investing in process, which might sound kind of trite, kind of advice you get in a newspaper advice column. So sorry, it's not that original, but I hope it's helpful nonetheless. I'm Sumana Hariharishwara. I can help you implement these recommendations through my consultancy, change Set Consulting, and I'm working on a book on managing existing open source projects in general, helping them get unstuck. And let's talk more in the chat after this talk, because I'd love to hear your stories about what works. Thank you.